I wanted to talk to you about your journey because I was after researching you and seeing all the stuff you've been in, hearing some of the voice that you played, I'm just like, it must, it looks like a fun journey, but also probably is even more fun to live in. Tell me about how you got started in acting. Well, um, I started in high school. I mean, I actually, if we want to keep going farther back, I was an altar boy. I was raised a Roman Catholic and I was an altar boy for six years. I learned the mass both in Latin and then in English, you know, because mm -hmm. it switched over at that time from uh, Latin to English. So uh, it was just something about uh, performing that uh, and being in front of people in an audience that uh, that really, uh, I don't know, I guess it appealed to me. I guess I enjoyed doing it. Um, as an altar boy, I went to I went to boarding schools and uh, at what and in the grade school, the elementary boarding school I went to. You, if you were an altar boy, you often got to go over to the girls' school across the way and get a really good uh, get a real breakfast, you know, <laughs> bacon and eggs and real toast instead of mm -hmm. the gruel that they fed us. You know, <laughs> yeah, at eat with the priests eat, uh, which was kind of cool. Um, and also, you know, when I was uh, four years old, my mother put me on stage. <laughs> Mm -hmm. with with my cousin Joyce uh, and we had to sing a duet of um, I, I, I've been working on the railroad all, all the live long day uh, for at the Bedford Park Illinois Community Center so it mm -hmm. was kind of I guess I don't know I was petrified and yet I still get petrified when I perform but there's something really? about it just oh yeah oh yeah I get nervous hey I, I get nervous making dinner for people you know so same same it's, it's, it's part of it's part of nature's way of focusing you you know mm -hmm. uh, that's that's my belief it's the universe making you say you got to pay attention to this and do mm -hmm. this right you know because you have to pay attention that's why so yeah. uh otherwise you're going to look like an idiot and i often look like an idiot anyway so it doesn't matter no uh, I, I teach <laughs> i teach that to my acting classes i, I mm -hmm. uh I'm an adjunct professor at a at a small liberal arts college here, Woodbury mm -hmm. University, and I teach acting for writers and directors. So mm -hmm. I always tell them, you know what, the whole purpose of this class is to enable you to make an ass of yourself. So mm -hmm. just remember that. You have mm -hmm. to have that freedom just to, to make that choice. Because people are always editing themselves beforehand. They're always trying to block their, their choices, you know, and let them come through and see what works, you know. Later mm -hmm. on, when fully formed, you know, the, the, the performance, that's when we have to try to get the same thing every time. But mm -hmm. but when you're when you're just exploring it, let it go. You know, mm -hmm. just let it. And um, the way I got my first professional job uh, uh, was uh, I was 19 years old, and I had been uh, to see a performance of uh, Death of a Salesman that that the uh, late actor Jack Warden uh, played Willie Loman in. It was at Arlington Park Theater and uh, near Arlington uh, Park Racetrack in uh, in the Chicago suburbs where I lived. Uh, in Arlington Heights, and um, I went with uh, my high school, one of my high school drama teachers, and uh, a man named John Marquette, who passed away last year, but was one of the most wonderful men. He and Jerry Lowe were my high school uh, drama teachers, and they, uh, I sort of like had my own repertory company the last two years. It was sort of the Keith Sarabica repertory. I got to play things like Murray Burns and A Thousand Clowns, Finian and Finian's Rainbow, Thomas Moore and A Man for All Seasons, Grandpa Vanderhoff and You Can't Take It With You. Plus I got to sing and dance my way into the hearts of dozens, you know, and, 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 and musicals, which is basically why I did it. Because some girls put me on on, on a dance list at, at one point and I, I ended up going, oh, that's a cute girl. I'm going to go to the class with her, you know. <laughs> The, the truth is the reason everybody gets into show business is to, well, if you're straight, it's to meet girls. And if you're, if you're not, it's to meet somebody, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, that's why we're all in it, honestly. <laughs> all in it to meet I people. Yeah. You're, you're, you're there to meet people. You're there to make acquaintances. You're there to get laid. Come on, mm -hmm. you know, that's <laughs> uh, so but, funny. uh, uh, and the way I got into the, to, to the acting classes was that I, I had gone to a Jesuit high school and I'd done some stuff there. They had a beautiful theater program there. Uh, I went to Campion Jesuit High School, which is now defunct. It's in Prairie, it was in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. It's it's now a medium security state prison. So that, that to give to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, and I, I still am friends with many people from there. In fact, we have a, a Zoom every three or four weeks in which mm -hmm. uh, several of us get together and, and talk, you know. And it's kind awesome. Of cool. yeah. yeah. You know, it's, you... it's so funny seeing people being the same at 67 as they were when they were <laughs> just, Yeah. 
you know, the, the, the seed of the person, you can go, they look different and I'm sure I look different, but the seed of the person is still there, you know, yeah. it's, it's the core, um, and which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I, 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 I transferred to this, uh, a public high school and, uh, and, and uh, John Hersey high school in Arlington Heights, Illinois. And I kind of hung out with a bad crowd, you know, cause we'd moved and, and it was, I, I was with the wild bunch where they were called the rat patrol, you know, and, uh, it was, we had the best parties, had the cutest girls, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. And all these guys, I didn't have a car myself, but all these guys had hopped up cars, you know, mm -hmm. like, they were fun. And, you know, people, uh, we, we, we had, we were organized, even though we were disorganized, it was not mm -hmm. a gang per se, but it was, it, it was 50 years ago. So, you know, maybe it would have passed for a gang. Let's put it. That yeah. Way. Okay. It was, it was a social organization. The, 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 the school policeman, um, uh, Sergeant, uh, what was his name now? I can't, uh, gee, uh, officer Kremke. No, it was like, I can't remember his name now, but he, he, he deemed us the rat patrol. But anyways, okay. to make a long story shorter. I got thrown. I, I got caught because I would cut French every third period and go and have breakfast, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and smoke pot. And, and then we'd come back and, you know, I would, I, I don't know, I'd be gone for the rest of the day. But, um, but I, I got caught. And so uh, I had to, um, I got suspended from school. And I was, when I came back, well, actually during the suspension, the Dean of Students called my parents home and I answered the phone and pretended I was my dad. It was the greatest acting job of my life. I mean, <laughs> That's amazing. I, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely look into this, you know. I, <laughs> I promise you, you know, I, I promise you, Mr. North, you know, that this will not go unpunished, you know. And uh, we, we, but anyway, I get back. <laughs> so good. I get back and um, to school, and they said, "Well, you know, you're going to flunk this French course. Why don't you try another course?" And I go, "Okay." And, and it just so happened that the third period there was an acting class that was that was open so i took that and it just kind of took off from there it made everything make sense to me do, doing the acting it was kind of it was it was very bizarre and uh, i actually could have graduated from there after the summer of my junior year but i was having such a good time i needed one more credit that i stayed the whole next year and as i said they made me into a it's sort of a, it was sort of the keith sarabiker rep company you know and um i then got a, a a scholarship to go to uh, Trinity University in uh, San Antonio, Texas, mm -hmm. a theater scholarship uh, run by uh, the man, the man who ran Dallas Theater Center, Paul Baker, who was a, a real theatrical educator. And the class that I took there was called uh, Integration of Abilities, you know, my freshman year. And it, it's the only acting class I've ever taken since high school. And it was more of a creative class in which you, you painted, you did movement, you did sound, you, you, you made a sculpture, you wrote a short story, and then culminating in writing a, writing a one-act play. Uh, and I actually got an A-plus in that course, so I hey. felt great about it, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's what get you in, get, to get you in touch with your creative urges, you know, your creative mm -hmm. self, your inner, your inner voice so to speak. And it was a, it's the greatest course I've ever taken. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But after that, I would get back to where I started this story, where I'm at, at uh, uh, the Arlington Park Theater at Arlington Park Racetrack in uh, Arlington Heights, Illinois, with my high school drama teacher and my sister and a buddy of mine. And we'd gone to see Jack Warden in Death of a Salesman. And I was so moved by this performance. It was on uh, like a late Sunday matinee that I said, I, I got to go now. And I dropped everybody off and drove in this company car because I was working in the summer as a field and lab technician for a construction um, consulting firm, um, which I was actually pretty good at. You know, I could have become a civil engineer mm -hmm. if I had the, the predilection for it. Um, mm -hmm. But I was in love with acting and it had become the thing that I just, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. That's all I wanted to do. So I drove down to uh, Lincoln Avenue in Chicago. This is in 1972 and uh, in June, end of June. In fact, it was on the same day as the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, but that's a whole nother story. Well, June, June, 20, June 25th to 26th, it was right well, around there. And I, I, I go all the way, which is where Custer was, was massacred, you know. Well, um, but anyway, um, I go, I go down and I, I said, well, I, it was like I was in a dream. And I drove all the way downtown. It's, uh, it, was, it, it was about 8.30 at night, you know, because the play had been in, a, it's about a 40 minute drive from Arlington Heights. 
and I, 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 it was like I woke up in a dream in front of this theater that I'd been to. I didn't, I didn't know where I was going to go. I just, I had seen a beautiful production of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, works that were a conglomeration of called Poe at the Organic Theater Company of Chicago that Stuart Gordon had directed, and it was just brilliant. And I, and I, it was like, going, oh my God, I want to do this. And so I ended up in front of that theater, and I'm standing there, and the and the play is just letting out. And they had it was this big uh, science fiction play called Warp. It was a, the world's first epic adventure play in serial form. It was in the three parts, uh, uh, Warp one, two, and three, and. Um, Trying to remember what they to die alive, I, I can't remember the the, the 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 subtitle, but there were there was a comic book on stage, mm -hmm. and um, all these people are getting out, and I suddenly woke up like out of this dream, going, "Oh my God, why am I here?" And I I I I, I, I leaned against the light pole in front of the theater, and as the audience was coming out, I started banging my head against the light pole, going, "I've got to stop smoking pot. I just have got to stop smoking." Pot. <laughs> And uh, and suddenly I feel this little tap on my shoulder, and uh, I look around, and, and and I look down, and it was this, you know, shortish man, but uh, and he's just looking at me, going, "Are are you all right?" <laughs> I go, uh, "Yeah, can I help you?" Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I said, "Are are you looking for someone?" And I go, um, "Yeah, yeah, I am," but I didn't know who I was looking for. And he goes, he goes, "Well, you looking for Stuart Gordon?" And I go. No, I don't know him. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for uh, Lenny Kleinfeld, who had written Warp? And mm -hmm. I go, um, no, I didn't know him now, but I know them now, of course. And mm -hmm. Stuart, I don't know if you're, he passed away back in March, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. You know, uh, he did The Reanimator. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that movie. You know, it was, it's, a, it's a big cult film uh, mm -hmm. uh, based on H.P. Lovecraft's The Reanimator. Um, and the, I was supposed to play the lead in it, but it doesn't matter. I, I, I <laughs> Oh. I turned it down, and Jeffrey Coombs did it instead mm -hmm. of me. Um, but um, <clears throat> anyway, so I, I'm there, and he goes, uh, and he goes, uh, he says, Stuart Gordon, uh, no, Lenny Kleinfeld, no. He goes, Zazu Pitts. I go, that's the one. Take me in to see her. And he goes, okay. So we go into the theater. There's an ante room in there on the side, you know, to get to backstage. And it was this big, brightly colored rug room with all these pieces of rug. It was very hippie esque, you know. It was a, uh, we were we were hippies, you know. Mm -hmm. We probably still are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm standing in the middle of this rug room, and and he goes, "Okay, um, my name's Bill Norris. What's yours?" I said, "Keith Sarabike." He goes, "I'll just call you Keith if you don't mind." And I go, "Okay." And he goes, "You know, Zazu Pitts is in here." He says, "Yeah, I I, I, I kind of figured that." And he goes, uh, "Well, why are you here?" I said, "Well, I'm I'm home from you know college for the summer, and I." just really want to get, you know, to, to work somewhere. I want to work uh, at a theater company. I want to just, I'll do anything. I just want to, I just want to be involved, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. he goes, and he's looking at me and I, and I was in really good shape then and I had long blonde hair and uh, I'd, I'd been running four miles a day, swimming, uh, you know, a thousand yards. Uh, and I just was in, I was in very good shape and I was tan from working outside. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I go, uh, I, and he goes, have you ever acted before? And I go, um, yeah, oh yeah, I act a lot. Mm -hmm. I I won awards and you know I won best actor my junior and senior year. You know at uh, at at Hersey High School and uh, and 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 I've worked in community theater. And he goes, really? He goes, you know what play we're doing now? And I go, um, well, mm -hmm. I I heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet. Friends of mine said that they saw this little guy's like a Woody Allen guy running around saving the universe. And he goes, and it actually had been him because he had had to step in and 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 oh. And, uh, when <laughs> someone when the, when the lead character got oh, hurt, yeah. so he had to step in, and he goes, "Well, that that was me," and I go, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, yes, it was," you know, and they they loved you. They thought it was hilarious, you know, and, and really fun. And he goes, "I got someone I want you to meet." I go, so he goes and he knocks on the green room door at the at the other end of the of the of the rug room, and uh, and uh, the the door opens, and this big huge cloud of pot smoke comes out and Stuart Gordon who looked kind of like Jerry Garcia only you know younger mm -hmm. <laughs> looks at, 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 at Norris and then he looks at me and then he looks at Norris and go and, and like he was going to ask him like what, what are you bringing your tricks in to meet me for you know and uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 Bill goes um, Stuart Gordon I'd like you to meet Keith I can't pronounce his last name Keith wants to audition for the role <laughs> of the Morp and Stuart looks at me and goes far out Come back tomorrow with a prepared two-minute Shakespearean reading, and and, and they turn around and go, oh, and make it something militant. 
And mm -hmm. you know, to make a long story short, they ended up hiring me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but uh, John Hurd was playing the part, the uh, late actor John Hurd, mm -hmm. who was one of my closest friends. And uh, he decided not to leave. He was 26 and I was 19. So they kept me on to do, uh, uh, to be the understudy and, and the sort of utility play, stunt player. Mm -hmm. That's what I did, and I got to go to Broadway about from from right. That that show went to Broadway, yeah. It Broadway, but it still went to Broadway, so it was kind of cool, you know. Mm -hmm. So, like, hearing this story is one one part about it is like how it all kind of is just falling into place. It sounds like you were working a job that you you were good at, but like you really were just inspired by acting, and then seeing it, you were like. I have to run to it. This is what I, I got to be. I got. I got to do this. And this it was yeah. so strange because it was literally this voice saying, "If you're going to do it, go now." Now I don't believe you know in the supernatural or anything like that, but there was something that went on there that there was some sort of connection. Who knows what it was? Mm -hmm. It just said, "If you're going to do this, go now." Mm -hmm. and God knows what would have happened if I hadn't. I have mm -hmm. no idea. You know who. Yeah. Did any number of things, you know, I probably would have ended up becoming some sort of academic, you know, and living in, in mm -hmm. San Antonio, Texas or mm -hmm. Dallas or something. Which wouldn't have been bad, but like, this is, sounds like what happened is, was the right reason, was the right thing. Like taking yeah, I, a leap of faith. I, I definitely took a leap of faith, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I left school, you know, and uh, I, I never went back to Trinity. Uh, mm -hmm. I did go back to the University of Chicago and because I came back and worked, you know, in theater after we, we bombed in New York. Mm -hmm. I came back and I, I stayed in New York for several months and then and, and did an off-off Broadway play mm -hmm. called Boua by Alfred Jari, which was fun. It was sort of in clown makeup and, you know, it was... Mm -hmm. Was scary for me, but <laughs> so like fun. for all of us, mm -hmm. uh, I remember Geraldine Page and Rip Torn came. It was a very small theater, it's about the size of my bedroom. You mm -hmm. know, you fit like twenty people in there, and uh, wow. there were more people on stage than there were in the audience. But it was fun, you know. Mm -hmm. Except uh, I left New York when that closed. I got fired from my job. I was working a day job as a waiter at a place where I never had worked as a waiter before, and I got hired. I got fired, I, I, which is another long story, but I won't <laughs> tell it to you. Yeah. And then, the, but at the uh, at the at the closing and the, and the play closed that that same weekend, and that night I went to the, I went to the uh, uh, it was a Sunday night I think or a Saturday night, and I, I went to the closing night party and I was staying with a friend out in Brooklyn and um, as I as I went ho went home on the on the train across the Manhattan Bridge suddenly the bridge went, <laughs> someone had put acid in the food you know, at the party. So I was up all night <sighs> tripping, you know, and I find the next morning, my, my buddy and I, we decided to hitchhike back to Chicago. And I went back to Chicago and stayed five years. I went mm -hmm. to the, I, I enrolled in the University of Chicago and, mm -hmm. uh, and worked at the Organic and several other theaters, um, you know, for that, mm -hmm. for the rest, for the next five years. And yeah. it was, and a great time was had by all, you know. And, mm -hmm. and it sort of culminated with the, uh, with Bleacher Bums that I was one mm -hmm. of the authors of and in the original production of it, which moved to New York mm -hmm. and stayed there, you know, yeah. uh, and I stayed, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about, this is the mainstream name that, you, that, that I see on your resume, but working with Stephen King, especially being the lead in one of his adaptations, <laughs> what was that? Stephen King, well, he, this was one of the first thing that was ever written by him directly for, that wasn't first uh, a, a short story or a novel. So and he wasn't really used to being a screenwriter. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you know the, 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 the things of his that have been big hits were, were, were written by someone beside him. I mean, mm -hmm. they, were, they were adapted from his work, but they were written by, like Misery was written by William Goldman uh, and uh, 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 The Green Mile and, mm -hmm. uh, and Shawshank Redemption were written by Frank Darabont. You mm -hmm. know? So he's, He's he's one of these writers that puts so much into uh, uh, just a paragraph, you know. That oh. and and writing screenplays and and plays even is sort of like it's more like haiku than 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 writing a novel. You have to you have to be spare. You have to be clear. It has to be. And he doesn't do that, you know. So oh. it it was it was it was a great adventure working on on Stephen King's The Golden Years, and I actually got to meet him. Um, but uh, he he played a bus driver in one scene in which uh -huh. uh, uh, Felicity Huffman and I are on a bus yeah. and open the door, and Stephen King is the the, <laughs> the driver. You know, so uh -huh. that was his cameo in it, which was kind of fun. And you know, that job I had I had I had ten hours of makeup every day on it. Uh -huh. you know? uh, yeah, it took an hour and a half to take it off. 
And the very first day that we we shot, we we had makeup you know tests and stuff before that, and I got to work with the great uh, Dick Smith, uh, who, who designed uh, d designed with Carl Fullerton and, and Neil Martz and Todd Kleitch um, designed the makeup, you know, and uh, and and Neil and. Uh, and, and Todd were the ones who applied the makeup, you know, uh, every day they were down with me. And, and 10 hours. And 10 hours, yeah. 10 hours. And an hour and, a half, hour and a half to take it off, all right? You have to understand that because it was, it's glued on. It's not just yeah. like, it's, they, they, they glue, you know, different appliances as they call them and, and then they paint it and then they, they did a whole thing. It was, it was a work of art. It really was. Mm -hmm. what they did. Um, and uh, they should have gotten a lot more recognition for it than, than, mm -hmm. than they did. Um, which was unfortunate, but you know, uh, yeah. we, we did eight episodes, but the very first day of shooting, a, a hurricane was blowing up, was coming up mm -hmm. the coast, all right, a tropical storm of some kind. And, um, you know, I, they brought me in at six, at 6 a.m. And I started makeup and at noon, I had lunch, you know, have my makeup half done. And by four o'clock, I was on the set, all right? Mm -hmm. And at that, and I was supposed to ride my bike onto this, onto this ferry that then takes me across to this secret government installation on this island. <laughs> Never got to shoot it because as we, we got to, we, they were setting up the shot that the hurricane struck. So, and the, the, the lead elements of it. So we, we never, we never shot that scene. Mm -hmm. And that my first day of shooting on that consisted of 10 hours, 10 and a half hours of makeup, an hour for lunch, and then an hour and a half of taking the makeup off. That was my first day of work. <laughs> and you have to be awake pretty much all that. Like straight, well, you, you can't be asleep during it. Yeah. You can't. You can't sleep in the makeup because they would they would glue things and you know over and under my eyes and everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I it was like having your scarf glued to your neck. But it was uh, it was kind of it was it was really cool. You know, and it was yeah. a, it was a fun job. And Francis Sternhagen, who played my wife in it, who actually was seventy two, mm -hmm. and I was playing seventy two. Uh, we couldn't have been a, a more wonderful person, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and Felicity was great in it, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, so it it just it's a it, it was a, it was a fun job. Let me put it that way. A long yeah. job, seven and a half <laughs> of that kind of makeup. Although mm. as as I got younger, my makeup got progressively shorter. Uh, towards mm. the end, it was a four and a half hours. You know. Yeah. Um, I want I want to talk about how how did you transition into voice acting, going from on screen to now doing voices. Well, uh, one of the ways, well, I, I, of course, had an agent, you know, and they liked my voice. Uh, yeah. So the theatrical agency, Jeff Hunter Agency, would send me out that I was at. And Jeff Hunter was my agent for 18 years, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, a, in a progression of different uh, agencies that he, that as he, as the agency uh, merged with other things and eventually became part of William Morris, where I, I got a little lost at William Morris and it was just, you know, and I moved to LA and became mm. a different thing. So, uh, and I had a manager and, and, but anyway, I'm one of those people that I stay with people forever. I'm not one of those actors who bounce around. Mm. Uh, but anyway, the way I got into this was, um, uh, into vo voice acting was that um, there's a place called Symphony Space and they used to do a program on, um, on, uh, I think it's WNYC uh, radio, FM and AM in New York. Uh, it's a public station in New York uh, called Selected Shorts. And they would read, and actors would read um, short stories uh, a before a, a live audience. And um, uh, so, and uh, one of my neighbors in my building, where I lived at 92nd in Riverside, was Isaiah Sheffer, uh, who ran, uh, was the artistic director of uh, mm -hmm. Symphony Space and ran a selected shorts program as well. Mm -hmm. And he had seen me in something and had been, we'd met and we were neighbors. And uh, he asked me uh, to, to go and do, uh, if I would do a, a, a selected short. And uh, mm -hmm. I said, sure, you know. And I didn't think it was gonna be such a big deal. Cause I went, it was a, I remember it was a Feb, it was like February, 19, 87, 86, and I go, I go to the Symphony Space, which was like four blocks from my house, and um, mm -hmm. and it was a, a kind of a rainy, cold day, and I went for the sound check, and we did we did whatever, you know, and then I went back home, had dinner, and I came and I came back at seven thirty, and I thought it was going to be, you know, fifty people maybe. People were literally hanging from the rafters there. There were a, a, a thousand people at least in in, 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 in in symphony space. And it was just, it was like you were a rock star. It was so weird reading yeah. the show. It was just you and the audience and the, and, the, and the story. And it was a most amazing experience. And evidently, I guess a lot of people 
who are in the voiceover business go to these things. And mm. I started getting calls after that, you know, and uh, I did selected shirts on and off for like 28 years. Uh, Isaiah mm -hmm. passed away like three years ago, four years mm. ago, you know, um, but uh, <laughs> it's becoming a theme in my life. People that I, I, I benefited from knowing them and mm -hmm. friends of mine are, are passing away. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of the kid in my uh, cadre of actors, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, <laughs> oh, um, I wanted to talk about uh, talk about that as well. There's been a lot of people that have helped influence and helps help helped you grow in your career. Um, who is one of them that really stands out to you when you when you think back? Like this person, really, if it wasn't for them, I never would have started any of this. Well, Stuart Gordon, uh, who ran the Organic Theater, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, he just passed away uh, uh, March 25th, uh, not from COVID, but uh, mm -hmm. but he he actually died alone because uh, you know COVID had struck and uh, people weren't being allowed in uh, in the hospital, so it's a it was a very sad moment. But Stuart, Stuart gave me artistic life. You know, I mean, my teachers in in high school and and Paul Baker, you know, were were great and instrumental in that, but. But but Stuart Gordon was who really gave me uh, my artistic life, and I will be forever grateful to him for that. You know, mm. uh, because working at the Organic was uh, was a dream. It was I mean it was crazy. It was wild. We toured Europe. We toured toured. Uh, we went to New York twice. You know, we uh, we we toured all over the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, and we did all new work. Everything was new, either new adaptations or, or stuff that uh, that was brand new, and some of which, like Bleacher Bums, we wrote ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which grew out of improvs that we did from, we, we were broke. We had just done a, a version of uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Sirens of Titan, which Kurt Vonnegut came to, and I played uh, the dog Kazak in it. Uh, I always said I played a 200 pound mastiff, but it was uh, it was it was an interesting choice. I was basically naked in it, you know, except oh. for a dense belt and and boxing gloves and a <laughs> like floppy big floppy hat mm. with like, ears, you know, that I would mm. shake everyone's. And um, the reviews said that Keith Sarabica as as Kazak the dog threatens total audience distraction at every <laughs> yawn. <you know? laughs> That's and so I funny. just, I just would, you know, move, and people were like, "Oh boy!" That's, you know. <laughs> I didn't put any awards for it, but I got, I got plenty of review and uh, yeah. reviews, and uh, uh, which I'm, it was, a, there was no line, so I, of course they weren't going to do that. But uh, Vonnegut came to see it, and I was at this girl who I just started dating. Her parents were like patrons of the theater, and he, we're sitting in in their living room, and kind of at the floor of the great man, you know, and and Vonnegut looks at me and he goes. Uh, I, I thought he was going to, you know, he says, I, I need to talk to you about this. And, and, and I go, okay. He says, uh, and I thought he was going to ask me, you know, some very literate qu qu question about, you know, adapting it or something, because we all helped adapt it, you know. And he goes, are you getting much play out of the dog? <laughs> basically, he was basically asking me if I got, that I was getting laid from playing the dog. And I, <laughs> Looking at the girl that I just started dating, I go, um, "Am I I'm okay?" <laughs> <laughs> this dog was so famous, so it was like, right. yeah, that's, that's so awesome." The dog became like, without a speaking role, became like the most popular character. It was very popular. About, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to also talk to you today about. Um, you, you said you said you were an adjunct teacher, and mm -hmm. adjunct, adjunct professor. I'm sorry, and now you're teaching on the lessons that you've learned. What are some of the lessons that you make sure that you that you instruct your students on that you learned yourself? Is to jump. Don't 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 edit yourself. Just jump. Just go for it. Because and, and enjoy what you're doing. Because the more you commit to it and the more you enjoy it, the more everyone else is going to. You know, mm -hmm. just, you just gotta jump. You just gotta do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the devil be damned. Go ahead and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, you know, that's, that's sort of, that's, that's, the, that's, that's what I try to impart to them, you know, mm -hmm. that, and, and it's, you know, it, it's not an easy business, you know, and it's a, you're going to get, even now, you know, it's like, I, I read for stuff and uh, I don't get hired all the time, you know, and uh, I run a theater company and everything isn't always perfect, but it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's always fun. It's always an adventure. You know, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very glad that I uh, embarked on that adventure. I'm, I'm very glad I listened to that voice back when I was 19 and it, took me where it took me mm -hmm. i'm happy you did too like this has been an amazing interview i love i love hearing your story like i can just listen to you talk for hours but i'm like keep going keep telling me more like i just it's it's so fascinating like all the lessons that you learn especially at a young age of 19 it's like when you took that leap of faith 
um, during the process of each and every single step, what was one thing that you always like held true to in like your morals or your values that you still have today? Oh, I have no morals. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, just be true. Be honest. Be true to yourself. You know. Be true to you know. Find find the truth in the uh, in the, in the, in the script and and then lay it bare. You know. Find what the find find what what's the essence of what you're doing and mm -hmm. and make sure that you expose it and 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 broadcast it. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome, Keith. Thank you so much for this interview. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you, Conrad.